once again. Good morning. Glad that you all made the trip here this morning, or made the trip to your computer this morning, so that you could be here. We're talking about road trips this morning, and and uh, we think this is a good way to journey through this Lenten season together. And uh, so, you know, most of you know I grew up in church. I grew up right here in this church, as a matter of fact. But it wasn't until I hit my 40s that I realized what a relationship with Jesus was all about. I mean, it was a long journey to get there. I I, I mean, I had gone to Sunday school here as a kid. I had gone to youth group as a teenager, and that did bring me closer. But like most young adults, once I was out on my own, I was relying on my own, on, on me instead of him. And it was not till I went through some very dark journeys of loss that I finally surrendered my life to Him. And it was a journey, a road trip through life that got me where I am now. And as a kid, I mean, we did not like take a lot of trips. My dad was a farmer who worked seven days a week, and he rarely took a vacation. And this, this may be one of the reasons that he died at the age of 63. But when we did take a trip, which was, like I said, wasn't very often, oh my, it, it was not a joyous thing. While the destination may have been fun, getting there was not. You know, first my dad would assign seating assignments based upon each child's weight so there would be an even ride on the tires. You know, the, before airlines started weighing your baggage, my dad was weighing our baggage to make sure that we didn't have too much weight for the car. Had to have that even ride on the tires. And once on the road, my dad was a four-pack-a-day smoker. Another one of the reasons he died at the age of 63. But he would smoke, and we were not allowed to roll down the windows. We also had to be quiet. And if we ever said we were bored, oh my goodness, you know, he, he would yell at us, you, need, you know, you may never pass this way again. You should be looking out the window. And we definitely, uh, I mean, uh, well, I don't know if any, any of you heard this too. This was another one. You know, we'd be driving along. Get your feet out from under my seat. It was, you know, we were used to hearing that too. Uh, but we definitely could not speak. We couldn't make noise. We definitely did not sing songs on our journey like some families do the only music we had was on my little cassette tape that I had taped off the radio that I had to listen to through an earphone so this morning though we want to begin our Lenten journey and hopefully a little bit better terms here our series called road trip and Lent is a six and a half week journey to Easter And when followers of Jesus spiritually examine their lives, uh, we can walk this Lenten journey together as we do that. Now, the church has observed Lent uh, since 325 A.D. And for us, Lent began last Wednesday, uh, our Ash Wednesday service. Hopefully you you were watching. If not, go back and watch it. Uh, But it ends with the glorious Easter celebration. And this year, our our teaching team felt the nudge of the Holy Spirit to camp out in the songbook of the Bible, the book of Psalms. And I've always found it interesting that the Psalms is right in the middle. I mean, worship is at the heart of what we do. It's at the center of what we do. And so, good, it's at the center of the Bible. It, It means that I'm a follower of God. And as the song says, you were, you and I were made for worship. So for today and for the following six Sundays, we're going to be considering seven kinds of uh, categories of psalms as we walk into the introspective uh, Lenten Road together. And really smart men and women have poured over these songs originally written in the Hebrew language and put them into types. These are songs that are not all the same because, well, life is not all the same. As many of you know, life is iffy. Remember, the word life has an if right in the middle of it. Sometimes we get mad at life. Sometimes, uh, there, so there's psalms that, um, that are, 
or to perk the, the, the a story in Psalms. It's it's their prayerful words that, well, they're kind of angry. Sometimes life is good, and we need to express our thanksgiving to God, and there are psalms for that. One third of the psalms, though, are called laments, because sometimes we get sad, and dark. And although a an a, a Thinesus, a early church a, a theologian, wrote, most scripture speaks to us, while the psalms speak for us. And this is the the rawness and the beauty of the psalms. The psalms capture the thrill, the emotion, the heartache, and the celebration of life and of our faith in God. And just let this sink in for a moment. These are the very songs that Jesus sang. Jesus, the Son of God, the Word made flesh, Emmanuel sang these songs with his mother Mary and his father Joseph and his brothers and sisters. Jesus sang these songs at the little synagogue in Nazareth known as Grace Church Nazareth Campus, I think. For three decades, he worshipped there. And we talk a lot around here about following Jesus. Well, if we want to follow Jesus, how about we sing the songs that Jesus sang? So to help us through the Lenten pilgrimage, we have put something together for you to do on your own, something uh, for you to do uh, with other pilgrims. And our team put together a, a, a Lent journal that every day you can personally, personally read and reflect on a psalm. And you can make these ancient prayers your prayers. So make sure, if you haven't done so already, we have some in the back. Pick one up before you leave today. But today we begin our Lenten journey together with one type of psalms called the pilgrimage psalms. And these were songs by worshipers uh, as they traveled to Jerusalem to celebrate Jewish festivals. They were literally ancient road trip songs. The ancient Jewish people sang as they traveled. And three times a year, a, a faithful Jewish family, or, and families, and by family I mean mom and dad and kids and grandparents and aunts and uncles and cousins, and no matter how far away, all traveled to Jerusalem for a major religious festival. And as they traveled, they would sing these songs. They couldn't turn on the radio, so they sang these songs together, looking forward to the joy and celebration they would experience when they arrived at the temple, the place where, to them, heaven touched earth. And according to the ancient uh, historian Josephus, the population of Jerusalem would swell from about 100,000 to 200,000 people during the Passover festival. These were busy travel holidays. Now, you can see these travel songs in our, in, in our Bibles in Psalms 120 through 134. Obviously, we, we don't have time today to, to take a look at all of them, so well, we just chose one that uh, is one of the most well-known and captures uh, some of the themes that we're, we're looking at and other similar ones that, to begin with. And we're going to look at Psalm 121 together today. I look up to the mountains. Does my help come from there? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not let you stumble. The one who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel never slumbers or sleeps. He will not let you stumble. The one who watches over you will, will, you will not slumber. Indeed, he watches over the, Israel never slumbers or sleeps. The Lord himself watches over you. The Lord stands beside you as uh, your protective shade. The sun will not harm you by the day or the moon at night. The Lord keeps you from all harm and watches over your life. The Lord keeps watch over you as you come and go, both now and forever. Now, before COVID, I'd, uh, every once in a while, I'd fly somewhere once in a while, a conference here and there, and and. So I, I've spent some time sitting in airports waiting to board. And there's always one scene I've seen, and I'm sure you guys have seen it too. It plays over again and again in airports all over. And it usually goes like this. A man and his wife stand at the gate together. The husband embraces the wife as, they're, as he's getting ready to board. And the man holds his wife's face and with his hands, and he speaks tenderly. And 
tears flow from their eyes and a kiss on the cheek, a hug, and the man makes his way down the tunnel to the plane. And the wife quietly weeps, anticipating the next trip when her husband will return home. And it's a moving scene. It, it is. Now, when we researched Psalms 121, we discovered something similar may have been taking place. So imagine in your mind's eye the extended family gathered together as some prepared to travel to Jerusalem, and while others had to stay home. And some historians believe this song may be, have been a, some kind of goodbye ritual for blessing the travelers and for those staying home. It appears that the first set of verses are spoken by the traveler and the, in, are in the first person, using the first person singular word, I and my. So look with me at the first two verses and imagine a traveler speaking those, to, those, to the group of those who are there to see them off. I look up to the mountains. Does my help come from there? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. Then the loved ones saying goodbye, staying there, would, would next bless those who were traveling with the affirmation from the rest of the psalm. Notice how the words change from first person to second person as they respond and they would say, of the Lord, he will not let you stumble. The one who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel never slumbers or sleeps. The Lord himself watches over you. The Lord stands beside you as your protective shade. The sun will not harm you by day nor the moon at night. The Lord keeps you from all harm and watches over your life. The Lord keeps watch over you as you come and go both now and forever. So these words of assurance would send the traveler on their way with a blessing from their, their loved ones. And some theologians believe that this was a call and response song that was repeated uh, to those that were traveling during uh, this journey as they needed these reminders as they traveled together to Jerusalem. Now, a few weeks ago, we talked about the reliability of the Bible as we said, God reveals the living word through the written word so that I become the loving word in a broken world. The supernatural thing about the Bible is it's not just a historical blessing for those people then, but it's for you and me now. The word helps us become the living words of God to our broken world right now. These are the words of hope and assurance that we need today. And here's why. You see, life can be a dangerous journey. Life is a contact sport. Back in 2014, as I was headed to my church I was pastoring in Port Charlotte, I got a phone call as I passed Del Prado Boulevard on 41 heading north. And the caller ID said it was Jamie, but when I expect when I answered the call expecting to hear Jamie's voice, uh, instead I was introduced to a paramedic who told me that Jamie had had a seizure and ran into the car in front of her, and they had taken her to Health Park Hospital. Now that's a long ride from Del Prado and North Fort Myers down to Health Park Hospital. Every light I hit, every snag in traffic, every slow-moving car in front of me, I mean, I was relieved when I got there and to see that she was okay. But I was not prepared for that phone call. I think no one is. No one's prepared for something like that. No one, no one knows when that call is coming. You go to work one day and are told your services are no longer needed. You come home one day and your spouse says, I, I no longer love you. You go to the doctor and he says, I'm sorry, there's nothing we can do. Life can be dangerous. It's a dangerous journey. So what then? Psalms 121 helps us. Let's get a little deeper and read Psalms 121.1 one one more time. I look up to the mountains. Does my help come from there? One way of interpreting this first verse is, well, the, the mountains represent a place of ominous danger. 
Mountains were the hideouts of places of bandits and robbers. We know this because 2,000 years ago, Jesus used this kind of a place as the setting for the story of the Good Samaritan, where an innocent man is attacked and beaten and robbed. Jesus places the story on the road that goes from Jericho to Jerusalem because the terrain was where robbers and bandits were hiding out, waiting to pounce. So let me ask you, what's waiting around the corner to pounce on you? What bandits have the capacity to leave you beaten and bruised and robbed? Someone here today is facing the bandit of anger. Someone else is struggling with the bandit of disappointment. Maybe you, you've got relationship turmoil and, and it's robbing you of your sanity. Maybe your bandit is bills and you have more month than you have money. Maybe your bandit is stress. Maybe it's a wayward child. And then there are the twin bandits, uh, addiction and afflictions, that have robbed so many and left them beaten on the side of the road. And your, man, your bandit miss might be just plain old, intimidating, paralyzing fear. Maybe it's divorce, loneliness, grief, chronic illness, loss, or maybe just plain old boredom with your life. Thank God the psalm writer doesn't just point us to the dangerous mountains and say life can be a dangerous journey. Better be careful. No, instead, he points us to a better way of traveling. Once again, Psalms 121, 1 through 2 says, I look up to the mountains. Does my help come from there? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. I mean, this traveling song names that life can be dangerous and it doesn't candy coat it. It's, it also reminds pilgrims that then and now that our help doesn't come from the mountains, but from the one who made the mountains. Our help comes from the Lord. But again, the psalmist doesn't end it there. In, in the verses 3 through 8, he describes this God who is our helper in two ways. He, he describes God in this way. God, our helper, is both powerful and personal. Look one more time at Psalms 121, 3 through 8, and notice how powerful and personal God is. He will not let you stumble. The one who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel never slumbers or sleeps. The Lord himself watches over you. The Lord stands beside you as your protective shade. The sun will not harm you by day nor the moon by at night. The Lord keeps you from all harm and watches over your life. The Lord keeps watch over you as you come and go, both now and forever. See, there are 7 billion people on this planet. And like a loving father, God watches over each of our breaths in and out. Like a watchful mother, he keeps, he keeps watch over our, his babies playing in the yard. Our God watches over His kids. And this is one powerful God. But did we notice how personal and intimate the word is that the psalmist used here? He will not let you stumble. The Lord Himself watches over you. This is our personal God too. You know, life is a, a dangerous journey. But we get to choose whether we will focus on the mountains, or the God of the mountains. We get to choose whether we let the mountains destroy us or whether we meet the God of the mountain who wants to help us. Centuries after this song was penned, a rabbi named Jesus gathered his students around him and taught them, and he told them, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy I have come that you might have life and have it to the full. Jesus acknowledged that there's bandits in life, but we get to choose. Will the thief prevail or will Jesus? And ironically, the, in the Bible, throughout the Bible, the mountain often represents a place where we encounter a powerful presence of God. The president of uh, Asbury Theological Seminary recently wrote about Psalm 121 and how the mountains were God's uh, presence transform lives in indeed history. He, he wrote this, God met Abraham on Mount Mora 
and provided the sacrificial substitute for Isaac. God met Moses on Mount Sinai and, and entered into a covenant with his people, giving them both law and promises. God met Elijah on Mount Carmel and revealed himself as the true and living God, not like the idols of other nations. Jesus met us on the Mount of Beatitudes and taught us the ways of the kingdom. Jesus met us on the Mount of Transfiguration and, and revealed the coming glory. And finally, the greatest act of all, God met the whole human race on Mount Calvary and revealed the greatest love for a lost world. The mountain can be, a, for you and me, a place of heavenly transformation and not of earthly trouble. It can be a place of God's presence and not the devil's prodding. The mountain can be a place where we meet God, our help, the maker of heaven and earth. So here's a question I want us to think about as we finish. On my journey of life, who am I walking with? Who are we walking with in this journey of life? I'm going to invite the band to come back up. We've got one more song to do. But I want you to think about this as this next song is played. Who am I walking with? Am I relying on my own? I know I did that for a lot of years. I told you that. I thought I could handle this. I thought I could do this. None of us can. Only He can. I like the saying that, you know, on my own I can do some things, but they amount to nothing. But with God I can do all things. Who are you walking with? Who are you walking with on this journey called life? I don't know, it seems to me that maybe we should rely upon someone who can create a universe and somebody that loved us enough to die for us instead of myself. I know myself. That ain't too good. So who are you walking with this morning? Let's pray real quick. Father, I thank you for these people. I thank you for those watching online. I thank you, Lord, that you walk with us. Lord, even if we don't recognize your presence next to us you continue to walk with us until the day that we will recognize you lord and i pray that for everyone here that that day is not too late i pray that that day comes sooner rather than later i pray that today lord they will recognize the creator of the mountains the god of the universe the savior of the world walks with us daily and Lord, we can walk alongside you and we can listen to you and we can be guarded from the, the bandits of the things that rob us of a, of a life that you want us to have. Or we can wait till the end of time when it's too late. When it's too late to recognize who's been walking beside us this whole time. Lord, you came to give us life to the full. And that's exactly what we have when we, when we have you walking with us, when we accept you as our Savior, and when we walk along with you, our life is full and abundant. We're full of joy. We're, we're full of peace. Lord, I pray that for each person listening or watching today. Lord, we thank you for this. Thank you for walking with us. It's in your name we pray. All right.